All right, thank you for your patience. Um, I am super excited to be with you today because we are talking about one of my favorite spaces, the Richard and Helen DeVos Japanese Garden. And let me open up the chat here. Thank you for your patience again. Um, let's get my, my screen share going here. Um, we will be uh, doing a haiku writing workshop today and discussing Jenny Holzer's For the Garden, um, which is an installation located throughout the Richard and Helen DeVos Japanese Garden. And let me get my slides going and we'll get started. I don't have a buddy today helping me out, so it's taking me just a little bit longer. There we go. So, all right. Let's get into our haiku. Okay, so today, in, this is an interactive webinar and I see some of you are already using the chat like, hey, where are you, we're waiting. Um, so some of you are aware, we do want you to use the chat and um, today is a little different. We've been saying, what do you see and what do you wonder about? Um, because we're gonna focus more on the poetry today, um, we've got some other questions that we're going to be asking. Um, what does this poem say to you? So please feel free to share your thoughts when we pause and ask for them. How does this poem make you feel? What do you imagine when you read this poem? And what other descriptive words could you use to describe this natural space? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss um, Jenny Holzer's work a little bit and um, her background. And then we're going to examine some of those um, pieces throughout the Japanese garden and practice uh, writing our own haiku. So again, um, we would love for you to use the chat and when you do have the chat open, you'll see um, who you're typing to. In the to space, make sure you change it to all panelists and attendees. Sometimes it will default to all panelists, and that means just I see it and not everybody else that is on this webinar. All right, let's discuss Jenny Holzer a little bit. Um, she was born in 1950. Hi, Lori from Hudsonville. Uh, she currently lives in New York, and she really focuses on words and ideas, but most, so her work is text-based, um, and she's focusing on the idea that the text is presenting. Um, she works with a wide range of media, but she's been mostly text-based light projection since 1996. So uh, while she was, um, an independent study in New York in 77, she started this series called Truisms and her work started to gain a lot of clout. Um, she projected digital text uh, scrolling through New York Times. Um, and they were phrases that um, challenged or used language as a form of communication, but also as a tool um, for concealment and control of hu the human population. Um, so that's what she was exploring with the, the truisms and a lot of her um, later work too. She was influenced um, by pop art and conceptual art, um, but she's also associated with um, a lot of feminist artists. Uh, I really love this quote by her. Um, I used language because I wanted to offer content that people, not necessarily art people, could understand. So um, her artwork is really interesting. If you're inspired today after exploring um, some of her work at Meyer Gardens, please check, check her out. 
let's talk about um, her work in our Richard and Helen DeVos Japanese garden. Um, so this is a site specific work. Um, she, she did this work specifically for the Japanese garden um, when we opened in 2015. Um, it features 13 hand carved boulders that are pl placed throughout the Japanese garden. So it's really fun to, uh, while you're exploring the garden, to discover these um, and take a moment to reflect on their placement because their placement is intentional. The surroundings were taken into consideration when the text was placed for each of these boulders. Um, and the carvings are poetic expressions from authors around the world. So this is not Jenny Holzer's writing, but it is, um, she worked directly with the authors or the direct translators for the authors um, when she selected the text for each of these boulders. Um, and they explore ideas around the garden and also natural mysteries of the world. Um, they're really thought provoking and um, nature based typically. So here's an example of one where the turtle has gone down, a dimple floats on the water. And this is actually in one of the more secret spots in the garden. So you have to really be kind of going off the beaten path of the main path to find this one. So let's talk about haiku a little bit before we explore some of those specific um, boulders that we've got throughout the Japanese garden. So what is haiku? Um, it is a short form, form of poetry and this is a classic. So this uh, Matsuo Basho is one of the um, masters, the very early masters of haiku. Um, and so the, the haiku poem says, an old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. <clears throat> so they're very short. They originated in Japan and they really focus on one brief moment in time and illuminating that moment in time with colorful imagery. Um, there's also a sense of, of a sudden enlightenment. So there's a little bit of an aha moment at the end or something surprising that the beginning of the haiku leads you into and then surprises you at the end. Oh, thank you, Jan. For some reason, it's, it's not letting me close that, <laughs> but I will figure that out. Um, so a haiku also typically has three lines and the, the syllable thing is a little bit tricky. So there it's comparative to syllables in the English language. Um, but in Japanese it's, it's related to the amount of sounds in it. So obviously when things are translated, they don't translate directly. Um, so that form in English speakers has kind of altered a little bit. So you'll notice in the haikus that we examined today, the syllable count is not exact because of the translation. Um, but if you're writing that in English, there are people who are super traditional about it that stick to 575 um, and then others who kind of deviate that from that. But if you're starting out, it's a good baseline to try to reach um, and have the 575 format in those three lines. Let's take a look. So what I'm going to do is play a, um, play a video for you, a short clip of the area surrounding one of Jenny Holzer's boulders in the um, sculpture for the garden. And then we're gonna take a look at the haiku and um, I'm gonna ask you some of those questions of what the poem means to you and what the imagery reminds you of. So let's take a look. I'm gonna make sure you can hear my sound.
okay. I was very excited to be able to um, capture that, our uh, cherry blossom promenade um, when it was in peak bloom because it, it matched up with this webinar on time. So if you didn't catch it on the boulder, I know it's kind of tricky to read. The poem reads, cherry blossoms blooming with all the strength they possess. Oblige me to view them with all the strength I possess. So my question for you is, um, what does this poem say to you? How does this poem make you feel? So feel free to share your thoughts in the chat. And if you're joining us from Facebook, we do have um, someone from communications who's helping us facilitate responses. So feel free to type those and they will get those to me. Jan says, a juxtaposition of delicate flowers and strength. Wow, I love that. Be fully present in the moment, yeah. Leah, that's, that's really what haiku is all about. The pale pink color seems soft versus strength. Yeah, Kylie, spring is here. So does that make you feel excited? Jess says, makes me feel like I'm part of the natural world, not separate from it. Right with that thought, it obliges me to view them with all the strength I possess. So it's drawing you in to be present and part of it as well. Rebecca, small but in a good way, yeah. Jan, be mindful. Susan, yes, there is strength in small things and small moments. Rebecca feels connected. Um, can anybody describe the moment in time or the sudden sense of enlightenment high highlighted here? And I think, Jan, you said the juxtaposition of delicate flowers and strength. Um, I think that's really hitting on that moment of enlightenment is flowers are delicate and beautiful, but there is something, um, there is an enormous strength when you see them all at peak bloom all at the same time. And I automatically start to think about the energy that those trees put into those blooms. Um, and it is powerful. It is strength. Does anybody else have any thoughts, any additional thoughts on the moment of enlightenment highlighted here? Jan says, strength in coming back each spring despite the harsh winter they have come through. Yeah a combo of grace and strength. Excellent. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Lori says the beginning of a year, right? It's kind of like the uh, the big reveal before summer. Okay, we've got another one. This is one of my favorites. So that one was um, quick at the end, but the poem reads, heavy with honey, below the belt, a bee confronts an enemy. Oop, and that one's supposed to read an enemy. Let's correct that. 
confronts an enemy. So what do you imagine when you read this poem? What are you picturing? Yeah, Jan, someone is about to be stung, someone or something. What does this poem say to you or how does this poem make you feel? A brave bee meeting a human, Rebecca, yeah. A focused little bee, Leah, distracted by an enemy. Are there any um, words or phrases that surprised you in this poem? Leah says, I love watching bees, so I feel a little anxious. Mm -hmm. Below the belt, right, Jan? That surprised me too, but I think that's what's great about it. It's, there's a bit of a personification with the bee, um, and there's a lot of play on words with that phrase in the English language, below the belt. Um, so you're, you know, when you imagine a bee collecting honey, they are becoming heavy. But then when you say below the belt, it's, it's you know, implies this um, machismo, this macho sense to the bee, but also the fact that it could be wearing a belt. And then it makes me think of the stripes on a bumblebee um, or other bees. Rebecca says, strong if I'm a bee. And I will say that... Um, as I was filming that bumblebee for this uh, zooming in, it did come at me. <laughs> and I thought that it was very cathartic. Susan says, honey is sweet. Below the belt is a bit threatening. Yeah. So there's that juxtaposition again. Just so we get a little bit of practice um with our writing imagery here um, would anybody like to share some other descriptive words or phrases you would use to describe this space or you would use to describe a bee collecting pollen yeah Lori. apparently i was the enemy combo of sweet but scary says rebecca Mm, I like those words, Jan, lush, humming, buzzing, a buzz. Oh, I like that word, a buzz. Leah says soft and sharp. Calm. Yeah, the space is very calming. I know you're not here at the gardens today, but if you were to describe the smell of the cherry blossoms, how would you describe that smell? Yeah, it's definitely sweet. Heavy with fragrance. Ooh, the word fragrance could be used there too. I like how you used heavy again. Soft, welcoming. Mm -hmm. Full, dense. Jan, yeah, spring if you have allergies is <laughs> probably bittersweet for sure. Kylie says peaceful. Fresh and sweet. Awesome. All right, we're going to move a little bit 
on from cherry blossoms here, even though I'm sure we could all ogle about them all day long because it's just so beautiful when they're in peak bloom. Let's switch gears here. So I don't have a video for this one, um, but I tried to capture these young leaves bursting forth in spring throughout the Japanese garden here. And the poem reads on this folder, the young leaves, all the shapes of hearts, the shapes of eyes. So let's start with what do you imagine when you read this poem? shared humanity. While we have differences, we are all alike in many ways. Jen, yeah. I didn't even think of it like that. I couldn't get beyond the imagery at first. Oh, an awakening. Yeah, and an awakening of spring and an awakening of your eyes when you first wake up. Leah, it made me think of a tree waking up and putting their heart out there figuratively. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, revealing. And I think one of the things that I love about haiku is that moment in time and that sudden sense of enlightenment at the end it leads you in a direction you think you know where it's going and then surprises you with a different idea so you're thinking about the shape of the leaves being hearts and so whatever that image of hearts conjures up for you whatever emotion that is if it's love kindness if you're thinking of it of an embrace and then it says the shapes of eyes. So it's the surprising enlightenment in comparison or an opposite. Um, but that can also be tied in. How else might you describe young leaves bursting forth at the beginning of spring? What um, imagery would you use or descriptive language would you use if you were to write a poem? about young leaves. Lori says, tender but strong. Jess says, eager. The eagerness of spring leaves is like the eagerness of being in love or falling in love. Yeah. Emergent, burst, hope. There's so much hope in spring. And I really like that, Lori, too. The, the tender but strong. There is so much strength. And I feel like spring happens so quickly. All of a sudden, you see the buds and then their baby leaves and then the leaves are bigger and then before you know it they're full size and it's summer it just seems to happen so fast compared to the long winter thank you for all those thoughts this is a very good uh mindfulness and exercise and presence this morning i appreciate your, part your participation. Rebecca, yeah, watching love bloom. All right, let's take a look at the next one.
I love that one. Someone is walking over the wooden bridge. Hear the deep frog silence. Yeah, it's surprising. Tell me your thoughts on this poem. What do you imagine? What does it say to you? How does it make you feel? What's surprising about it? Jess, this is my very favorite one. It's sweet and calm and a little comical too. Mm -hmm. Leah, the rhythm of the footsteps contrasting the natural sounds or quiet. Walking, walk, walking sound over calm. Yeah, Lori. Jan, surprising since there is sound in walking over the bridge versus deep silence. Perhaps it is about the silence the person walking hears. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't necessarily silent the day that I filmed it. We were, we were quite busy that day because it was such a beautiful day. Oh, yeah, Rebecca. Maybe it's about someone walking, but nature goes quiet. Yeah, I hear the deep frog silence. So right when the frogs are going and you hear them and then you get a little too close or crickets and then they stop. So you would call it the frog silence if you're waiting to hear the frogs and then they were silent. And I agree with you too, Jess, with the, it's comical that you don't expect si the word silence to be um, in this poem when you're talking about walking over a wooden bridge and frogs. Those are not the sounds that you imagine. You do not imagine silence. So it's a, it's a surprise at the end. Jan says, maybe nature is holding its breath, wondering whether this person is friend or foe. Yes, do I pay this sound mind or do I move on? I continue. What other descriptive words could you use to describe this natural space? As you're thinking of those, um, I will also say that I all, one of the other reasons why I really enjoy this poem is associated with the wooden bridge that we have. This uh, the particular bridge that is featured here is called the zigzag bridge. And it's built intentionally in a zigzag formation to force you to slow down and take in your surroundings. So when you're walking in a straight line, you're getting from one place to another. But with this zigzag, you, if you've done it a few times, you will notice that um, you do slow down and take more in. Let's see. Um, Jan says, pathway, contrast, some things budding and blooming while the larger trees are still largely bare. Yeah. To slow you down. Rebecca, peaceful but stony silence. Oh, I like that word, stony silence. Connect her to your thoughts, to the other side. Yeah, it would be really interesting to explore maybe even a stream of consciousness um, with writing as you walk across the bridge. And I like the connection to nature, Jan, that you had with um, some things are budding and blooming while larger trees are still bare. 
So there is a lot going on nature-wise here. There's lots of color from the blossoms, um, but there's also still a lot left to bloom and grow. All right, I'm gonna move on from, okay. So it's your turn. So what I've done is I've taken a um, clip of another area in the Japanese garden, which actually currently doesn't have any of Jenny Holzer's boulders placed. Um, so this area does not have a poem associated with it. So it's your turn to create one. Um, so I'm gonna play the video. And then what we'll do is we will work together to collect as many descriptive words and thoughts as we can. And then we'll have that bank together of words and we'll take a few minutes to um, write our own haiku. So just take a moment to take this in and then um, I'll play it again and I'll start collecting your descriptive words. Let's collect some of those words that you would use to describe this space. Yeah, I love the various water sounds. Rushing, falling, trickle, echo. Great. Ooh, nourishing. I like that. Hurried to get calm. It's very different on the other side of the bridge, huh? Rush, stream, trickle, cascade, overcome obstacles. Ooh, rush, pulse, loud, flow. It's going to make a new. thoughts here and add those thoughts there too pulse loud flow hues of spring divert unstoppable veil Reaching, ooh, flow, tumble. Do I have flow? I do, but I'm gonna add tumble there. Ooh, 
humble babe reaching scraggly arms definitely those new uh those budding trees can look like scraggly arms go around okay so ooh mesmerizing let's add that there too Okay, so what I'm gonna do is let's go back. Um, let's go back to the rules of a haiku, just for those of us who aren't as familiar with it. And we'll go over that one more time. And then we'll come back to our descriptive words and we'll take a few minutes to write our own and share. So remember a haiku is very short, three lines. And do your best to stick to five syllables, seven, five. Um, but don't worry about it either because this is just a short exercise. You can always get a rough draft going. And then if you really want to work on it, you can um, kind of pare it down. Um, remember, try to focus on that one brief moment. And then have that sense of enlightenment or that surprise at the end. So let's come back to our descriptive words. And I'm going to say, let's take five minutes and come up with is one good one, or if you want to write a few in that time, and then we'll share those via chat. So I'm going to mute myself and share this screen so we have all of those ideas we can work from.
All right. Hopefully you've had some time to get some thoughts down. I see some of you have shared your poems in the chat. Um, I'd like to read those out loud for uh, folks who are joining via Facebook Live. Um, Susan says, mesmerizing rush, thoughts streaming and diverting, overcoming obstacles. That's very hopeful. And I love the mesmerizing rush. And comparing the water to your thoughts. Rebecca says, I'm being hurried. I'm rushing, twirling, swirling. I hurry to the calm. I hurry to the calm. I love that surprising bit in there. Jan says, winter melts, tumbles, rushing over obstacles. Yes. Leah, bursting hues of spring, mesmerizing, excite, rush, pulse. Calm diverts my soul. Ooh, I like that. Okay, wait. Jan has the third line. Winter melt tumbles, rushing over obstacles, springs forth again. Ooh, I like that play on words with the springs. Springs could be used so in so many different ways, right? It could be a verb. It could be the noun, spring. Susan, trickle down to hide, veils of rushing and tumbling, echoes of calm. Trickle down to hide. I like the veils with the hide. Excellent. These are so good. Rebecca, I'm a veil of mist. I'm pulsing, rushing, falling to the hues of spring. Wow. I like that. I like, oh, these are so good. Thank you for sharing. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, Jan's got one. Oh, you're going to use the scraggly arms. Scraggle arms reach in, bathe in, spritzing spray, eager to refresh. I feel refreshed reading that. All right. I would love for you to run with this. Um, practice writing haiku in your own backyard or your neighborhood or when you're on a walk. Um, sometimes I really enjoy taking a notebook with me when I'm on a hike and, and sitting down and trying one out. What will you observe with nature while you write? Nature will surprise you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, stay tuned on our website and Facebook page for more interactive visits each month. Our next Zooming In um, will be focused on our watershed. We're partnering up with um, Plaster Creek Stewards to do a cleanup and um, from the cleanup, we're also going to collect some of those recyclables to do a found art project. So that zooming in will cover what was accomplished, and then you'll learn a little bit about Plaster Creek stewards and our watershed and how you can protect, help protect your watershed. Um, and that will be on June 3rd. So thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a beautiful day. It is looking like a gorgeous day out there. So enjoy. Bye.